it's, it's always dangerous when an old friend introduces you. You never quite know what will happen. But uh, um, we would like to thank the League um, and uh, Calvin for his very gracious uh, introduction. We're very pleased to be speaking here tonight among friends and colleagues. It's great to see so many friends. Um, Mary and I first worked together on a project sponsored by the League. Uh, it's called the Vacant Lots Project. I think Rosalind Ginevra was involved and Francis Hall's band. And later we had an opportunity, as Calvin mentioned, to be part of the Emerging Voices series. Um, so it'd be fair to say that the League has been a setting that's been very formative to the trajectory of our work. In fact, Mary and I started working together through a League project, so maybe there's an income-producing idea there, match.arc or something <laughs> like that. Uh, uh, but the League did bring us uh, together professionally, and I think we're uh, eternally grateful for that. Um, right. This, this project, some of you may know uh, a little bit about it. It's the Seattle Art Museum's Olympic Sculpture Park. Uh, but this was an international competition that we were fortunate to win. And it was an amazing brief. Right in the middle of Seattle were three separate parcels of land of which the museum acquired right before the developers managed to get them approved for 12-story um, condominiums. They managed to slip in line and acquire this property and convince the city that they could actually work with the city on their property here to create a sculpture park. Now, when we read the brief, there were some uh, interesting questions. This is a contaminated site, a brownfield site. It used to be the site of Union Oil of California's transfer facility, so you could imagine how contaminated all three parcels were. This is a high-bodied, wide-bodied federal trunking route with 20-foot clearance requirements. This is a BNSF Railroad and Amtrak going through the site. But the museum was fearless and said they wanted to create a sculpture park like no other. If you start to think about it, it really had to do a lot of things. It had to create salmon habitat, if possible, if they were to secure federal funding. It had to deal with the train lines, the trolley, the highway, the trucks, and also start to create an urban presence with its own museum and gallery building on the site. Well. The real question was, how could this be done in the simplest of ways? And so you can see in our competition aerial view, it was this idea in some ways of the, of the waterfront edge in the park invading from the water's edge and making its way into the city. Now, just so that you know, in a sense, golf courses follow the same trick. You have a very finite landscape. They put in a series of linear tree breaks, and you wander back and forth and back and forth, thinking that you're in a significantly larger landscape. So while this is only nine acres, that was the attempt to elongate and slow down the whole experience of traversing this area, as opposed to the shortcut on their diagrams that the two bridges might have created. But this slowing down is actually something that you can see here in the, in the built view that literally it's most urban at the urban edge by the city, but it actually goes underwater. The city, uh, actually the museum owned the tidelands underneath here, so it actually takes down the seawall and forms the first waterfront beach in the city, so that this true chameleon from urban to sub subterranean and subwater based was the uh, agenda behind the park. So this chameleon section you could see here goes from very, very architectural to a subsurface water-filled landscape and traverses the highway and the train tracks, 20-foot clearance here, 23-foot, 6 clearance, but all with the great benefit of a 40-foot grade, grade drop that allowed us to do this without the ups and downs that would be associated with the flat site. But it really is, uh, it's a highly layered system. It's a system that superficially allows you to see the landscape and the artwork but it has a subsurface system here that has a roughly a two-mile underbelly of infrastructure so that you could have water, teledata, electricity, and power going through the site so future artists could use it in a number of different ways. It also had to deal with the, re uh, the remediation uh, wells, the monitoring wells, but also could gather water to bring it down into a channel and release it into the bay and cleanse it and also then even think about how it met the city's base so that movement could continue to happen through the site while there was a bucolic underbelly. Now, if you look at this, this is a site partway into construction dotted, showing it underway, but it's roughly 260,000 cubic yards of earth, and we were incredibly fortunate that the museum was also expanding their museum downtown and had to dig a very big hole to get that, that uh, parking garage in, so we were the beneficiary one mile later 
of 260,000 yards of clean fill. Now, actually holding this earthwork in place was one of the biggest operations that was important. And what we didn't want was vertical walls that you get on a highway that would make it feel like you were driving down a canyon, but nor did we want something that laid back so softly and so smoothly there'd be no land left above. So we created this uh, interesting section here with the uh, great brilliance on the part of our civil engineers, MKA, which was called MSE, or Mechanically Stabilized Earth, that could hold itself in any incline, and then clad it with a series of precast retaining walls that could slip over each other and ascend just 42 inches above the grade of the pathway so that with one move we could void handrails and all sorts of architecturally you know, vivid things and simply pull off this earthwork um, in a very simple way. So this is it. This is poor man's uh, gabion wall. These are stainless steel cages with rock that uh, holds the edges being put in the lifts, and these are the uh, precast concrete panels that are slipped. Seattle's a seismically active zone, and what we wanted to make sure is that if there was any uh, unexpected movement, that the slippage uh, between the panels could happen without destroying the kind of continuity of it. Now, what we liked very much was not creating a kind of smooth, continuous line, but also creating a forgiving, marked edge that could uh, let you know precisely the change of grade as you moved up. But they also catch light rather wonderfully. This is the reflected light from the Teresita Fernandez Bridge that um, we'll talk about a little later. But this whole question of the trucking route troubled everybody, but what we were excited about was giving it a kind of focus and definition. This is it under construction, the bridge uh, work but the whole idea is that uh, we thought that the museum actually could put in a tripwire right here and claim that anybody who went through Elliott Avenue was actually a guest or a visitor of the museum, so their attendance could really go up. Um, but indeed, the trains were pretty exciting, and you could see the kind of pass-through here of uh, Burlington Northern and this trolley barn, which, by the way, it, it took uh, we were almost in the midst, in the late end of construction documents before the city finally agreed that they would indeed move it. We were asked at one point if it could be incorporated into the project. But it was moved, and indeed we were able to then put the bridge in with this incredible thrust block of concrete to handle the 110-foot long spans across the train track. And that itself would become a great place for the train spotting community. Uh, not just the museum goers, but the train spotters, which are great. The freight trains have up to 140 cars. And then the throw fence, which BNSF Burlington Northern is the equivalent of the Vatican. They require a certain height throw fence, which also has a block on the other end. We created a framework so that the artist Teresita Fernandez could create a glasswork that would change the color of light. But there it is. This is a waterfront edge. It's a very slender parcel. But being able to ascend up this staircase means that you don't need to wait the 22 minutes for the 140 car trains to pass. You can actually cross and get above to the city there. This seawall was rebuilt, and what you can't see underneath here, though, is what's called the bench or the aquatic bench for the juvenile salmon. Talk about that in a moment. You can also see here, this is the uh, water collecting wedge that carries all the runoff through and down to our newly formed beach. And you can see Roy McMakin's ampersand right there uh, that turns for the love and loss piece. But there it is. It's the first beach uh, where you can put your toes in the water in, in downtown Seattle. But what was more important is that this, uh, this piece was funded with $2.5 million from the federal government because, indeed, it creates salmon habitat for juvenile salmon. And as, as we learned on this project with two aquatic scientists, juvenile salmon are an awful lot like their human counterparts. They travel in groups, they're picky about where they go and what they eat. And this is the kelp that has been grown and is thriving on their behalf. So in many ways, the art program evolved as the design evolved and it gave, I think, the museum a chance to think a little more carefully about commissioning art in a much more inventive way than is often the case, where it's usually plunked down in a sculpture park from you know collections and becomes a sort of repository of, of slightly sad sculptures. This is a view of the Teresita Fernandez uh, throw bridge. Teresita is a, a relatively young artist, so this was actually her first public commission, uh, and she took this kind of slightly lurid sort of cloud 
um, sunrise, sunset, and kind of played with the idea of optics, what you see. Another artist, uh, an incredible artist actually, a joy to work with was Mark Dion, who always plays with the kind of uh, ambiguities between culture and nature. Mark's idea, which we thought would never fly with uh, the museum board, was to take uh, uh, an 80-foot log, nursing log, and house it in a greenhouse. Uh, people said, well, Mark, what are you going to do? And I, he said, well, I'm going to go up and get a huge log, we'll nurse it in a greenhouse, and that's going to be my sculpture. And we thought he was joking, and they said, great. And so here's this, uh, actually, I think they had, we had to reduce it from 80 feet to 70 or maybe 65 feet. It's an enormous nursing log. Um, we're told it'll last uh, for 100 years, um, and then who knows what'll happen. But there you see it sort of in shroud. In sh it's almost like a kind of, I don't know, sarcophagus. It's, it's a fantastic thing. Uh, the green is, is uh, there. Not only is it a sort of beautiful thing at night, but it also simulates the light conditions so that this uh, nursing log will de decompose slowly and sustain life forms. So you can go in there and see probably I don't know, 200 different kinds of slugs, insects, worms, uh, all sorts of things in this uh, amazing vivarium. Uh, but you can start to see its relationship to uh, the intersection of Broad Street and uh, Elliott. So it becomes this kind of uh, incredible diorama and plays off of the pavilion. The pavilion itself slopes down so that we're sort of trying to make something about the ambiguity of whether the landscape slides into the architecture or whether the architecture slides out. It allowed us to do an amphitheater. Seattle's got a very active film community, so um, uh, there's a, an active film program that's being planned, so this will be a place to watch film during the summer where it's, when it's very dry. But it also provides a setting for Richard Serra's uh, incredible wake. Um, and we wish we could kind of freeze this moment. This is when these incredible slabs of Corten steel came from New York, from Queens, actually, to Seattle. Um, one by one, it's, it's sort of the dance of the elephants. And um, so uh, this is it. Uh, Seattle has this wonderful diaphanous light that I'll talk a little bit about, but it actually, it's damp and it plays wonderfully with, with the lights. Um, and our intent was to make lighting a kind of active ingredient. Likewise, it's an artificial landscape. Marion mentioned all the lines of teledata that, that uh, snake through the park. This is a, a temporary piece. There's a sort of program of art. There are a series of site-specific pieces, classic modernist sculptures like the Calder, but also temporary pieces. This is a, a laser uh, sculpture by Alessandra uh, 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 Iole Alessandrini. So the grass becomes almost crystalline, a beautiful piece. This is a piece inside the pavilion by Pedro Reyes. Uh, kind of plays with the great tradition of, of Mexican muralists. This will come down soon. There'll be another piece that will last six months, a series of pupelas. Um, the idea was that this not be a black box, but be open to the view. I mean, we love the way you get certain things that we hadn't expected, these kind of compressed views that talk about the topography of the site. And uh, I think Seattle's very proud of the fact that it's uh, an outdoor city, but is uh, a city very much of this next century. So we played with the idea of, of not falling into the kind of cliches of the Northwest timber. The pavilion's clad with uh, a sophisticated uh, uh, sort of system of pleated stainless steel that plays with the quality of light, the changing quality, the sort of very ephemeral quality of light by day, by night. Um, sometimes the stainless steel looks almost black. Um, other times it sort of catches this very soft, overcast light, becomes almost like zinc. Um, and then uh, adjacent to that is uh, very thin mirrored fritted glass that plays with the sort of uh, the dynamics of the city, the kind of quality of the city. And we'll actually close with a very short film and you'll start to see how um, sometimes a sort of unprogrammed, unplanned events uh, can sort of magically retransform things that we might not have expected. But you can see actually in this surface here as cars slide by, we tried to develop a system of of uh, uh, faceting so that they played with light. But uh, finally, it's about uh, sort of bringing nature to the city and bringing the city to nature. Thank you. Thank you.